Okay, hi everyone. Um, my name is Richard Perry. Um, I am going to be giving you a webinar today on the importance of trading strategy. Um, now, this is sort of the first webinar that I've got in my series of um, a few tips and techniques to help you uh, sort of improve your trading, really. And we've, um, I've sort of called them tips to save you pips because I think um, hopefully what I've got to talk about is going to help you to uh, get through your trading and um, try and avoid trying to become a uh, another one of the sort of losing statistics that you find in Forex. Um, now, uh, just before I get into it, um, let's go. There you go. Right. Um, just before I get into my presentation, usual um, aspect of doing the disclaimer. Um, disclaimer is obviously very important because I'm, I'm actually going to be talking about live market information as well. So um, that will hopefully mean that um, if you've read the disclaimer, everything will be okay. Um, as per usual, a little bit about me, um, market analyst for Handtech. Um, I've been in the city for 14 years, um, done a, a variety of analyst roles, um, both fundamental and technical roles. Um, but uh, I sort of bring those two together to try and um, uh, bring my expertise to the market. And I hope that uh, what I've got to say to you today, you find interesting and informative. Um, what we're going to look at today? Well, first of all, we're going to look at um, how you begin your trading, um, thinking about a trading plan, because it is very important. Um, and um, having a strategy for your uh, for your trading is, I believe, um, sort of one of probably the most important things that you can do before you start um, is actually think properly about your trading and um, how your style and your risk profile will drive um, your decision making. Um, I'm going to look at how you derive your trades, sort of looking at um, uh, sort of the decisions, uh, how you come to take on your positions. Um, you need to be understanding the risks and also importantly, having a tr an exit strategy is also very important. Um, I'm then going to go on to a little bit of live market analysis. If I've got time, I'm hoping to have some time. Um, so I'm going to do that uh, towards the end. And at any stage, I'm hoping that you will be able to, well, you can ask me any questions you want, really. Um, and I hopefully will be able to help you out with them. Um, before I sort of get into it, I will uh, try and reiterate that this is um, uh, the first of a series of, uh, of webinars that I'm going to be doing. So if uh, if your questions that you ask are going to be covered in a future webinar, then I'm sort of going to sort of defer that. But um, hopefully, uh, anyway, um, if you have got some questions, I'll try my best to answer them. Right. Okay. Now. Right. Let's get into this. Um, now, there's a lot of important work that you need to put into before you start trading, um, because I, a stat you've probably heard of is the fact that 90% of tra uh, retail traders lose money when trading Forex. And I think that, um, therefore, it's, you need to appreciate that preparation is absolutely vital to, um, to your trading. Um, you might think that some of what I'm going to talk about today may appear to be a little bit obvious. Um, but I think you'll be surprised as to how many retail traders um, do not employ a proper trading, uh, proper trading strategy. And therefore, I think that they um, probably are added to that 90% statistic when they don't necessarily need to be. Um, so I, I think that I would say that even if you've been trading for a while, I think it's important to understand some of the practices that um, can help you to engage the correct mindset for your trading. Um, and I think that there's, as I said, a lot of work that you need to do even before you even put your first trade on. So um, I can't actually tell you the exact trading strategy you need to employ because I think every trader is different and I think every trader has different different trading requirements. But I think that um, if you're any, in any doubt, then you should probably be having a conversation with your broker or your account manager to try and help to figure out what your trading requirements actually are, because I think it is obviously very important that you don't get into situations where you feel uncomfortable when you're trading. So um, a trading strategy will hopefully help you out with that. Um, so before you start trading, I think you probably need to ask yourself a few questions, really. First of all, what do you want to achieve? Um, now, the question, I suppose, is are you trading full time, part time or just putting positions on just for the day, really? Um, the other question being, is it a secondary income, maybe sort of an income that 
just helps you with a little bit of a holiday perhaps towards the end of the year i mean who knows i mean essentially the question is what is your time commitment to your trading that's that is probably the key thing that you need to decide upon because then you need to um then it can sort of derive how um how important this um how important trading is to you and uh, the uh, sort of effort that you need to put in you then need to think about um monthly cash targets i think or earnings and and sort of um what your targets are for your for your trading how much you can afford to invest and i suppose even how much do you want to invest because that's they are two different things really um you might be able to afford um a lot more than you actually want to trade um and it's uh, yeah, hopefully what you want to trade is a lot less than what you can afford. Um, also, how often do you want to be trading? I mean, um, are you looking to become uh, to be? Are you looking to be a long-term trader, someone who sort of trades over a, um, a few days or weeks, um, or you're a day trader, sort of in and out during the same day, or maybe even a scalper where you're trading sort of multiple times a day? So um, ideally, you've got a, a commitment to monitoring open positions, um, and I would I'd say that sort of mobile applications or or um, sort of mobile apps uh, are better um, at helping you with this if you're on the move a lot. Um, but uh, certainly, if you can't, if you're not able to sit behind your desk all day, then I think um, that uh, mobile apps can be very useful for that. Um, but also understand that mark, uh, market conditions are constantly changing in the forex markets, and certainly uh, at the moment with um, significant uh, volatility in these markets, you've got the eurozone, uh, Federal Reserve making moves um, across uh, a whole range of um, forex markets. I think there is a lot of volatility, and you need to sort of keep a keep a finger on the pulse, especially if you're if you're looking to sort of be a day trader. Uh, you need to be constantly monitoring your positions. Uh, because um, prices do move significantly on uh, on news events, um, so there's a lot of work involved in gaining success in forex trading. Um, so, if, what I would say is, don't be fooled into thinking that uh, forex is a get rich uh, get rich quick scheme. Um, forex essentially is no really no really different to any other investment, and shouldn't really be sort of treated as a, as a bet. Um, you, I think it is it once more you need to be doing a lot of research. I believe. Uh, into before you're doing your trading because um, you can um, very quickly lose a lot of money uh, if you're if you're sort of playing around with leverage and uh, you don't really understand what you're doing um, and once again I sort of reiterate only trade with the money that you can afford to lose because um, that is very important I, I would also say get to grip your get to grips with your leverage um, you've got a little box here a key tip box trading one lot would expose you to ten dollars worth of um, move per pip. A mic, uh, sorry, a mini lot would be one dollar per pip, and a micro lot is ten cents per pip. So um, you need to, uh, I think, get a gauge of that um, because I mean, if you look at uh, one lot as a general rule, it's sort of a hundred thousand of the base currency. So, say for example, if you are trading euro dollar, um, and at, at an ask price of sort of one dollar ten, you would be essentially buying um, hundred thousand euros or selling hundred and ten thousand dollars. So, um, in this instance, a one pip move on a one lot trade would be the equivalent of ten bucks. Um, and it also depends in, entirely upon your trade size as to how wide your stops can be. Um, so, if you've got a smaller stop, you can take up take on more risk. Um, and uh, you need that. I think um, you need to understand that, and I'll go into that in a little more detail in a bit. Right, risk per trade. Um, so once you've um, once you know how much you want to trade, and I suppose the frequency that you have uh, you have uh, an idea of trading, then you've got a bit of a, an idea of your trading style. So then you can have a look at your risk per trade, and I think it's it's absolutely vital to understand the size of the size of trades that you're going to be putting on, um, which is uh, obviously a big element of risk per trade. So, say for example, um, in terms of your your portfolio size, your overall your overall portfolio size, two uh, percent risk per trade is I mean it's a general rule of thumb. I wouldn't say it's it's something that you have to stick to. Um, say for, uh, so, for example, if you've got a ten thousand dollar account, that would mean you'd be able to risk two hundred dollars per trade if you were risking two percent um, of your portfolio. 
Um, so here we go. Uh, here's sort of that in practice, really. So you've got a ten thousand dollar account. You're, you've got a 2% risk per trade. Um, what trade size does that mean you can use? Well, again, it depends on the size of your stop. Um, so this is that's that calculation there for $200 of your risk um, of your portfolio r risked on the one trade. And you've got a 50 pip stop. So therefore, what sort of size position can you put on? Well, you do $200 divided by 50. That means you can risk $4 per pip. And going back to what I said earlier about um, mini lots, uh, mini lots is one dollar per pip. So therefore, at four dollars per pip, you can trade four mini lots on that trade. Now, um, what derives your trading ideas? Um, I mean, the question I suppose is, where do you get your ideas from? Really, um, do you get it from technicals, fundamentals? Or long, um, or sort of news flow events. Um, I I personally use uh, a lot of technicals and fundamentals and news flow um, because I think all of it has a part to play in where where markets move. Certainly, I think fundamentally that has um, a big impact on longer term positions. Uh, technically, I think you can trade around uh, in in near term nearer term positions and also uh, you can also trade on news flow because that creates big sharp volatility and big movements um, and you need to be aware of that as well um, but what I would say is um, try not to complicate your techniques because usually the simple ones are the best um, and uh, the other thing is be flexible because trade management um, is very important I think you need to be um, look making sure that you are managing your positions um, managing positions is something i'm going to talk about in my next webinar and um i think is um is one of the uh, the most important factors when when you're um in the middle of your trading um so i mean trade management also depends on the kind of market you're trading in so if you're say for example trend, uh, trading in a market that's moving sideways um compared to a market that's in a trending situation anyone who's um sort of uh been any part of my technical analysis webinars will know um that i look a lot on about trend lines and trending situations now for markets going sideways then you need to be fairly sort of um, quick in and out, I think, in your trading, and you can't leave your positions on for too long. Whereas if you're in a big, strong trending market, then you can afford to leave your positions open um, if you've picked the right move, um, because then you can run the trend higher. So um, if it's, um, as, as I said, yeah, so, so basically if you're bouncing between a, a high and a low, then you need to take some quick profits. Um, and if not, you can leave your position on for a lot longer. Um, the other thing is, I suppose, if you're using technical analysis, you need to be very careful as to exactly which technical indicators you use. I would say do a lot of back testing um, have a look at the indicators you feel comfortable with. I I've taken you through uh, in the past, um, I think, 10 different indicators. Um, that's just 10 out of a whole raft of indicators. I mean, they're the 10 ones that I feel comfortable with. It doesn't necessarily mean you would feel comfortable with them. So I would say uh, do some research um, do a bit of back testing. Maybe even trade on a demo account um, using your technical signals um, to try and come up with um, an adequate trading plan and um, trading strategy. And um, yeah, I, th I think that's pretty much the way to do it. I mean, for example, recently I've been using parabolic SARS quite a lot, especially in big, strong trending markets, um, because I like to um, I like to use them as effectively your technical analysis tool for your trailing stop. I think they work very well. However, parabolic SARS, for example, do not work in a sideways trending market. Uh, another key tip that I've got here is is um, is emotion driving your trading decisions, um, and it's something obviously you need to avoid. And um, emotion trading is it can be a very big problem in trading because it can cloud your judgment certainly uh, and influence any strategies you've got on. Um, now it's one of the big points I'll be covering. Uh, in a future webinar, but um, but for now, I'd say that just take it that tr trading with emotions, um, I suppose emotions such as fear, maybe greed um, or uh, or revenge, can make a, a significant dent in your trading account because you're not trading with um, a clarity of thought. You're sort of trading almost with the red mist. 
and that's never really the best way to do it. Um, so I suppose the best way to overcome emotion training is to devise a strategy and, and basically stick to it. If you can stick to your strategy, then it sort of takes a lot, uh, an element of the emotion out of, of how you derive your trades. So I sort of reiterate again, do your research, back testing, preparation, find a strategy that works for you. And even if your strategy is, is not working, um, then just have a tweak, um, sort of see if you can adjust it but don't um don't completely ignore it because obviously um you've come up with a strategy um through hopefully a fair amount of thought process and uh, it'd be it'd be unwise i think just to ignore it completely so um okay um so when you're deciding your trading plan there are a few things i think you need to consider um I suppose, first of all, what's your style of trading? Um, how many trades you want to keep running at once? As I said previously, um, just now, the the important part of trading is knowing exactly how much of the overall pot should be risked risk in any single position. So there is no hard and fast rule um, as to exactly um, how many variables are involved in deciding um, the ideal trading size, But and there's no one-size-fits-all method for determining this. But... I suppose theoretically the trading size should be proportionate to the amount you have available to the trade um, and I suppose helping to prevent an ultra high risk strategy. I mean I said earlier that 2% um, was a fairly decent rule of thumb. Well I suppose if you're, if you're risking up towards 10% of your trading account then I think that is getting pretty risky um, and uh, obviously the other factor is if, if you're if you're a scalper and you're putting on 20, 30 positions a day, then I think maybe sort of risking less than obviously 2% because you're going to be running quite a lot of the time, running um, maybe multiple trades. And uh, I think um, you can reduce your risk size um, accordingly. So um, I suppose if, you, if you're looking at the um, overall, uh, your trading size compared to the size of your portfolio, your risk profile, trading strategy, and also your... Um, the, the the instrument that you're actually trading varies um very much impacts um on how you should be um should be a, a accumulating your risk um so generally i mean if you look at say for example a smaller uh, portfolio size um then the smaller the portfolio the larger the trading size will become as a percent as a proportion of your portfolio because say for example you you are losing uh, in your trading positions you then have to um, adjust your trading size accordingly because it, the, the size of your pot would be falling. So you'd need to um, uh, you'd need to sort of proportionally reduce the size of your trading. Otherwise, you're going to be taking on a lot more risk in in that scenario. Um, another consideration, I suppose, you've got in terms of trading size is um, different instruments have different margin requirements um, and therefore I suppose they can sort of take up more capital. Say for example if you're trading FX you might be able to get an FX um, margin of say 1% um, but whereas if you're trading gold maybe you can sort of only get a, a margin of say 3%. Um, so in that in, in that instance, in that example, so it would take a $1,000 to be able to trade one lot of, of Forex whereas it would take $3,000 to trade one lot of gold. Um, so uh, you need to just you need to just consider what exactly you're trading as well. And um, and finally, I suppose risk profile is key as well. So um, just the more the more uh, speculative you are, the, the higher risk um, and the higher proportion of your portfolio you might want to take on as a risk. Um, okay, so. Right, so sort of to sum up really, um, as I said earlier, trade management is, is very important and I'm going to be looking at that uh, at that later. Um, things you need to consider is what type of trader you are, your trading time horizon, how, how, many, um, how many times a day you're going to be trading, you're going to be trading daily, weekly, um, sort of intraday. Uh, it, it all has, uh, it all sort of comes together as uh, sort of deriving what your trading style is. Um, and also, so um, just actually off the top of my head, I, I just realized that um, if you're thinking about trading longer term and you're going to be putting positions on for a longer term, then you've got to just um, you've got to think about additional costs such as carryover as well. 
um, say, um, say for example, in, an intraday trader would not need to pay carryover. Whereas, I suppose if you're trading over a number of days, and I suppose even uh, weeks, months, then you would certainly be paying a lot over in carryover as well. And the final thing I would like to say today is have an exit strategy. Um, having an exit strategy is uh, it's, it's extremely important because um, just because you press the button on on the trade. Uh, to buy it doesn't necessarily mean you just let that run um, and uh, it just runs it runs its course on its own. You need to have an exit strategy because it's um, it's sort of you you need to be managing your positions and you say for example you're in a, a nice profit you see you, you're seeing a, a decent bit of upside and if you're not if you don't manage that position and have that exit strategy in place then you can see that um, that profit turn very quickly into a into a loss and that would probably hurt quite significantly if you if you've mentally seen that in a profit so you certainly need to think about that um so i'd say certainly manage your stops and, and your targets um there is an old adage in trading which is cut cut your losses and run your winners um but also, I would say that you need to sort of whilst you're on, whilst you're within your trades, uh, you need to sort of be adjusting your trof, uh, your profit and your stop targets. Because, um, I mean, the, w w when I was um, sort of first coming into trading, I, I sort of had a, an idea that maybe have um, uh, a profit to loss ratio of um, of, of, uh, what, of three to one. So you've um, so you have uh, three times uh, three times profit to, to one side. In terms of your downside so if you have say for example a 50 pip stop maybe you're looking for a 150 pip target um, but uh, also when once you've seen that trade start to move maybe hopefully move in your direction once you see it um, approaching your target you need to adjust your um, profit ratios uh, accordingly so uh, you can you can manage the trade in the position but I'm going to talk about that in a, in a, a few weeks time in my next webinar and um, and uh, hopefully that will help you as well. Right. Um, well, that's a bit early for that because I'm going to show you a bit of trading now. Um, now, that's sort of the uh, the theoretical side of it. Now we're going to go through a few. Uh... Let me just do that. Right. Let me go through a few charts um, because I know a lot of you uh, like technical analysis and um, obviously want to know what the markets are doing. So this, first of all, is euro dollar. Um, I would say that euro dollar is um, it's still I mean, it's certainly still rallying. I think that's a given. And it's had another strong day today. Eighty seven pips up on the day um, that's four strong days in a row I thought early this morning it could have been falling over but certainly had a huge intraday turnaround I think as as risk appetite has continued to uh, sort of improve really um, in the last few days and um, what we've um, what we've now got is the euro sort of pushing up towards this um, these big levels of resistance now let me get my crosshair because you've got these 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 highs that come in um, from the March highs of uh, between sort of ten thirty and ten fifty. Um, you've got a few few highs there, um, and they're all going to play a play a part, I think, in in the uh, in the resistance of this um, of this chart. Now. I think overhead you've got a significant amount of resistance. Um, so you've got these highs here from March and April, but you've also got the the resistance of this old key low from January as well. So I think sort of you've got maybe 70 pips worth of big resistance there. And I think that that is something that ultimately I think will pay for um, for this rally in euro. I think if you look at these momentum indicators, for example, looking at the MACD lines, they're consistently consistently below the neutral line um, and that is that is not um, indicative of something that's going to be bursting higher I think it's still in the realms of a of a bear market rally um, I think at the moment what we're seeing is a sideways range um, that's sort of building up and I think it's going to continue really um, what the big thing that we've got to look out for obviously is we've got the FOMC tomorrow night and um, I think that uh, that's going to have a big bearing on this chart. But certainly in the near term, you're, you're sort of continuing to maybe just just 
run the um, run the positions towards the upside. Let me just change that code because euro on the hourly chart continues to break higher. This is that um, pattern over the last sort of two weeks, really. Um, and it certainly has broken out. And it's that's a pretty I mean, on this on this chart, you'd actually argue that's a pretty decent. Um, let me just do the Fibonacci projection. That's a pretty decent wedge, actually, that you can drive. And that gives you an upside target. Oh, crikey. 109.90. Bang on is the 100% upside target of that wedge pattern um, that we've had in the last few days. And pretty much we're not far from that. Well, 89. <laughs> Two pips. Um, so, yeah. So pretty much we're now in the realms of of hitting that hitting that target. Um, so already we're starting to come up against um, the upside. That upside target has been reached uh, from this breakout. Um, and that's before sort of 30 pips above. Um, am I sort of... Am I, I, no, no, it wasn't 109.90. Fine, sorry. Um, yeah, so that's even before you've got to these key levels of resistance. So I'd be very interested to see what happens um, in the next sort of day or so because I think that... The chances are that we're going to see the euro falling over at some stage soon. Right, let's go to cable. Cable is more bullish than euro. I mean, we had that bullish breakout on uh, on the euro, and the equivalent upside target of that move is 153.40. So again, cable is pretty much hit that target, but it's it's coming close to a really big, really big level of resistance and um if it can uh, if it can continue that rally i mean it's, it's 200 pips away from where it is um from the big resistance on this chart because i think if you look at this on a on a longer sort of medium to longer term basis you've still not really had any key reaction high arguably you haven't really had a key reaction high broken yet Yes, you've had this sort of breakout above the one one dollar fifty resistance, but I think if you saw that move above one fifty five fifty, which is that February high on cable, I think you would see um, that would be sig signalling a, a a significant improvement in cable. But I think that that is equally speaking that is a big big overhead resistance, and you need to be sort of mindful of that coming up. So you've had this. If you look on the um, on the hourly chart, now let me do that upside target on your hourly chart because I think you'll find it's pretty much done it. Fifty three thirty. I mean, it depends on how you've you've sort of configured it but 53.35 say so we've hit that target again today so that upside breakout from that move has been hit so that is now in the price that's um that's been accepted you would certainly say that the um the trend is strong um you've still got this strong uptrend intact um and a sequence in the last certainly in the last week or so of higher highs and higher lows um so that continues to run high you're even um Interesting because I actually sort of said this today on my on my daily video that I saw that the um, 55 hour moving average was forming the sub basis of support in the last week or so, uh, 23rd, 27th, and that was the spike low. If I zoom in here today, that spike that was the spike low following on from the GDP data for the UK, 51.74. Hit that 20 hit that 55 day uh, sorry 55 hour moving average almost to the pip and then went higher. So I thought, uh, I found that very interesting. Um, and uh, that is um, obviously a bullish signal. Uh, st it was still positive, still running this one higher. You'd stay, you'd stick, I, I, I think you've got to stick with the bulls at the moment, but you also in the problem, you've, you've got the potential problem of um, FOMC tomorrow. And if FOMC, for, say for example, comes out with something um, slightly Bullish, uh, sorry, a slightly hawkish tweak to the statement, then you could well see uh, cable coming off. But 
I think the likelihood of that happening is fairly slim. I think they're going to just play it by ear once again. I think they're just going to say about um, being data dependent and uh, not really changing the statement in any... There's no real need to change the statement because everyone knows it's data dependent. So I don't necessarily think there is going to be too much... Um, in terms of uh, surprises from the FOMC tomorrow, it's not um, it's not a, uh, a, st- a press conference, and it's also you're not getting the um, the FOMC projections. So there's nothing really too significant that I think is going to come out from tomorrow. I might be wrong, but um, I think that uh, ultimately this run on cable um, continues higher. Um, it has, as I said, achieved already that upside breakout target from that um, sort of wedge pattern or flag pattern, whatever you want to call it. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm still sort of running with this. I mean, you've got six days, six strong days in a row now on that cable chart. So just uh, that is running higher quite nicely. You would argue RSI up towards 70 now, which is arguably getting a bit stretched. And if this is if this is a continuation of this sort of old um, long term bear trend on cable, I think that we could start to see the um, RSI losing a bit of upside impetus um, quite soon. And bearing in mind the fact that we're coming towards this uh, big level of resistance, um, sort of between 53.20 and 55.50, which I suppose arguably is 200 pips, so there's a fair bit of room in that, but uh, still that's fairly big element of resistance. Ultimately, also, you've got the aspect um, of the UK general election on the 7th on Thursday next week. Um, in, and uh, that should, theoretically, if it all goes as the uh, polls are suggesting, that would um, likely to put volatility back into the downside, uncertainty over the, the um, probably be what would be a weak government and um, drag cable lower. But um, at the moment, certainly cable is, is pretty strong and it's actually probably the strongest of the Forex majors at the moment. Now, dollar yen is probably the most boring chart around that you can find at the moment. Let me just zoom in slightly so you can see that a bit better. Um, it's sort of going sideways. Um, you, you get these sort of downside move, upside move, downside, upside, downside, upside, downside. I mean, who's to say that this is not once again going to see the uh, support coming in and um, in support coming in and uh, just um, seeing that uh, sort of 118.50 is where that initial support comes in. Although you'd say that today has been a fairly disappointing day on uh, on, on uh, Dolly A because you had found some support coming in um, at 18.75 and it's sort of fallen over and it's just about to test that again, it would appear. So we're still um, in a slightly bearish, slight, slightly bearish um sort of bias to this band now i've got this got this level in at 190 i mean it says 190.45 but it's 119.40 now let me show you why hourly chart on japanese yen look at the amount of times that 119.40 has been used as a big pivot level goes all the way back to this breakdown in that was the FOMC, actually, uh, on that day, I believe. Big sharp move to the downside. Hit 119.40 pretty much on. And then subsequently, it, you've used it time and time again as the basis of support and resistance. A big pivot level. Big pivot level at 119.40. And again, yesterday. Why? There you go. Again, yesterday, we had a rally and it hit 119.40 and fallen over. So you're still in this sort of negative sort of aspect of this bear, uh, of this um, sort of trading range, sorry. But we're still not really getting any major selling pressure. So you'd say arguably if you got um, just a dip back towards maybe 118.50, I mean, I I don't think dolly yen is going to break down. I really don't. I I just see this as a range. Um, Just looking on the daily chart, I just see that as a range. I don't really see it as as a majorly bearish. I mean, yes, there is a slight bearish tint to the momentum indicators at MACD falling below zero, RSI sort of spending a lot more time towards 40 than 60. But it's so sort of minor that I think it is just a just a, a bit of a, a sideways range. And we've been in this sideways range now for sort of two months at the least. If not, you could argue six sort of back dating back to November, six months. 
So uh, Dolly N is a very, um, very sort of sideways ranging market and there's no real direction in it. Um, and with that in mind, I think you've got to be sort of trading on a basis of maybe using um, positions of either intraday or just a si- single day or maybe two days max in, your, in terms of your positions because you just can consistently get these retracements that happen on Dolly N. And when you start to see a bit of a trend developing, it just completely turns around. So uh, I think uh, Dolly N is, um, although it has a, a slight bearish tilt to it, it's still, I think, in a big range. Right, Aussie dollar. Now, this has moved something chronic today, really accelerated higher. Um, really has had a big, strong move. Look at the daily first. Look at this. Interesting. We're, as we speak, going through 08 figure um, and 0815 is the big resistance sort of where it comes in uh, sorry 0825 sorry my mistake 0825 was the rally high there and the reaction low in a couple of days in Jan so that is the resistance but I think this this Aussie dollar chart it just said, looks like it really is actually making a base pattern so you've got not only have you got that breakout above um, $1.50 50 on cable you've got this move on the Aussie as well um, and you're seeing look at the RSI on the Aussie dollar now that is the highest it's been since sort of eight well April last year now so that's a 12 month high on that on that uh, RSI so that comes with um, a break a big break obviously of that ba- of that long-term downtrend you're seeing a breakout above um, the key resistance levels of um, 79.37 and you're now testing that big resistance, I think. And if you move, if you saw dollar, uh, Aussie dollar above that 0825 resistance, I think that that would um, constitute a bit of a turnaround. Now, I, I mean, the, the cautious sort of um, side of me would say that uh, you've still got this 144-day moving average falling, and you've not really yet, um, you've not really yet sort of broken that uh, that big bear sort of moving average sequence but it's having a big turnaround and I think um, what you need to now do is just um, look out for your pivot levels because there are a lot of pivot levels on dollar on the Aussie dollar that happen frequently so let's just zoom out all the way there that so that that's that big base so coming back in I mean let's put a horizontal line 37 right so that's your big support now obviously 130 uh, 179 sorry 7937 so drag that over there and you'd certainly say that you're overbought near term certainly on the hourly chart anyway and you've seen this big acceleration higher um there's no real no, there's no real reason why you can't continue to um can't continue higher on the Aussie but um, I think it's getting to the realms of being overbought so I wouldn't necessarily chase this I'd be looking out for maybe looking for a correction back towards 79.37 and looking for if you start to see support around that level because theoretically you should start to see support around that level the next support below that is 78.40 at these highs uh, and also you saw that breakout and then find support around those highs and then it really accelerated higher today. So that is your sort of key support, I would say, 78.40 on the near term chart. But 79.37 is your breakout level as well. Um, so I've just seen a question, really. Uh, Hi, Richard. Isn't Dolly in the same chart with consolidation as Dollar Cad? So I see it potentially moving to the downside. Okie dokie. Well, let's have a look at dollar cad. Now, obviously, dollar cad has broken that big range. And we're now back towards that big down, that big uptrend, interestingly. So you've sort of unwound that range. Now, that range, I haven't actually done this yet. I should have done, to be honest. That's a bit lazy. So let's say, so 27, so 28. 20 down to 2360 so that's 470 460 pips 
to the downside from 23.60 is 19 figure. So the downside target of that is not far away, actually. Uh, if you class that as a top pattern, which um, you probably would. Um, so 119 figure, you've still got 130 pips if you're going to take it as that. And not only that, you've broken down again today. So you'd say that the momentum on this um, on this chart is becoming increasingly increasingly bearish. There is still a further downside potential, uh, RSI at 30, but you've got this big uptrend that comes in. It's been in place since August, really. Um, and it, uh, what I would say is don't necessarily get too caught up on this uptrend quite yet because I, I think you did obviously accelerate a long way away from that uptrend. So I, I would say maybe not... Um, Maybe not sort of take any profits or just just think that it's going to start to find support. And that you what you'll find with uptrends or or trends generally is that they're they're a guide. Um, they're not an absolute. So you've got a bit of congestion around here, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that I, I'd be interested to see what happens now in the next few days. Also, you've got the RSI towards thirty, so arguably you're sort of getting towards oversold positions anyway. Um, but that 119 figure level, if I start that crosshair about there, yeah, I mean, it's perfectly possible you could see the see that CAD below that. So I suppose that that's CAD strengthening. Um, so your your question being um, same chart with consolidation. Well, it's not really because um, it's already had that breakdown. Um, is it? Is it the same chart? I wouldn't say it is the same chart because I, I think they they run on they run on different aspects. Certainly, Dolly N is a much more more of a safe haven, whereas the the CAD is sort of very much oil orientated, and I think that's uh, that's sort of more of a, a function of that that rally in the oil price um, that we've seen in the last few weeks. Obviously, oil and that. So for, okay, let's do it very quickly. CLC one similar sort of position. The opposite of that. So oil oil has based out, rallied, and it's not it's not gone sharply high, but it certainly has sort of started to base out. So I think that uh, the CAD is more of a function on that than uh, than in its sort of relationship with dollar yen. Okay, um, I had a request for the kiwi. Again, similar sort of picture to the Aussie, although not such a strong move today. It is interesting that we are seeing these moves um, that are happening as the the dollar. I mean, let, let, I mean, let, let me just show you very quickly. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of dot dxy. This is dollar index. Dollar index, which I suppose is a big function of the uh, of the euro, and the reason being that it's about fifty odd percent made up from the euro. But look at this sideways move, um, and you are now really testing that. So 96.17, and wow, it has actually broken it. Actually, it has broken it. Interesting, because you're seeing all of these all of these Forex pairs now sort of starting to base out. It's, the fact that it's coming just before the FOMC would suggest, I think, that the market is anticipating a fairly dovish FOMC. Or not certainly not hawkish anyway. Um, the market would not be buying um, all these forex majors against the dollar if it was expecting a hawkish um, FOMC. So that would that's exactly what that would suggest. Um, you're on on the brink of seeing an upside break above 77.40 on that kiwi, close to it. Um, and then you've got the big overhead resistance that comes in from this candle here. 78.90. So let's just zoom out and see what happens there. I mean, to be honest, it's it's sort of a, a bit of a range, isn't it? I mean, that that would be your next 78.90 would be your next resistance. But it certainly looks like. I mean, it has actually arguably completed a base pattern, although it doesn't look great. Um, it was very messy, but you could argue that is a double bottom. Um, interesting that um, the kiwi is now above the 144-day moving average. If, if you remember. Back to that Aussie, it was quite a, still below the 144 day moving average, but the Kiwi is actually above it. 
So that is interesting. Um, and we're seeing, yeah, you haven't quite had the breakout yet. I mean, the momentum indicators are not really confirming, whereas that Aussie was really strong on that um, on that move uh, on the um, on the breakout today. Right. Okay. Uh, question on euro dollar. Do you think it's a good trade uh, to for a limit sell position at one eleven fifty nine? Well, I said earlier that there was that big resistance around 111 figure. 111.59. Now, I'll be interested to see where you get 111.59 from. But still, um, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, judging by what we've just looked at, all these, all these charts. So you look at cable, you look at Aussie, you look at Kiwi. Look at CAD. They're all bullish breakouts. Where at? Or they're building for these bullish breakouts. Whereas the euro, I think, is still lagging in that regard. Um, and you can still see that the euro's got to break out this, above this big resistance, and it's still sort of a little bit of way away from doing so. So it's still 150 pips away from a 111 figure. So I think that um, the euro is still a big laggard, and I think maybe you could. Um, if you're going to play that sort of game, then you'd be sort of looking to maybe even hedge. You could sort of go long on one of those other pairs and maybe short on the euro um, to sort of hedge that off. But certainly, it looks like the euro is lagging. Um, I don't know. I, I don't really understand where you get 11.59 from. Um, I would say that um, maybe you'd be looking. I'd be looking out for sell signals between 11. Uh, sorry, 110.30 and 111.00 figure would be what I'd be looking out for. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, Jay, if you could sort of, um, okay, if you, if, if, if you were sort of looking for a specific around 1159, obviously that is a very specific number, so I don't know where that's coming from, but, um, yeah, if, um, I, I'd be saying, yeah, I think I'd be looking out for sell signals at the moment, um, around that figure, but you've also got to bear in mind that, um, I mean, these, these other forex majors are breaking out um, against the dollar, and that's that is now dragging that dollar index down. So, <laughs> general area. Okay, fine. Um, it was pretty specific for a general area. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. So yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, it. It's a. Di I think this is a difficult. This is a difficult moment in in forex because you're sort of seeing these these short term rallies that are up to ma uh, significant medium term resistance levels. And I think with that in mind, I think that you could be at a big sort of turning point, either sort of turning point whereby these rallies continue strongly higher or you get a big correction once again and the dollar goes on another big bull run. And yes, you have had on that dollar index the breakdown or you're sort of looking for the breakdown, but it's not I wouldn't say it's confirmed by any means yet. And, and considering the fact you've got FOMC tomorrow, I think it could be. Um, yeah, it could be a, a bit of a, perhaps even a, uh, some false breakouts on these charts. So you need to be mindful of that, I think. Um, so, uh, yes. Okay, I've been told I've got five minutes left, so let me just quickly look at gold. I haven't done that yet. Oh, Christ, what's going on there? That's so annoying. Righty ho then, gold. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just still in this big. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna swear then. Uh, it's still in this big sideways range. It's very boring. Um, you've had a couple of strong bull days, but you're still within the range. Um, you have broken out above twelve ten today, so I'll give gold that. Give it its dues. It has done that, but sort of see it along the same sort of lines as oh that's actually happened in the last hour interestingly so some maybe something has happened um obviously i've sort of been on this call so i can't i don't know exactly what's happened but there's been a big strong move to the upside a breakout above that 12 10 70 resistance but you've still got 12 24 12 24 being a big overhead resistance it's sort of capped february march april sort of highs um, and it would need certainly a breakout above that to really start to get interested. But even then, I mean, just looking at the momentum indicators, not really doing a great deal. Um, moving averages sideways as per usual, just 
and it's just it's it, i mean I, I was going to use the word painful but obviously we've had a couple of bullish candles in the last couple of days but until you get a breakout above 1224 or below 1170 what is it now 1175 as that low from yes uh, sorry two days ago or a breakout above 1224 i'm not going to get even remotely interested in sort of calling any targets on gold once you see that breakout you should theoretically see the the, the width of that or sorry the height of that uh, of that range so we're look, talking about 1178 up to 22 12 24 so 46 um 46 bucks either way so 46 bucks to the upside of 12 24 is sort of 68 uh, or to the downside which would be back towards these lows here again um sort of area so that would be what i'd be thinking on gold and until you see a breakout either way of those two i'm not really that interested in gold um silver does tend to move a lot more than gold oh, what's happened again that's so tedious okay let's try that again no idea why that happens so yeah silver does tend to move a lot more than gold um and it's been weaker than gold um recently it's actually been interesting because the gold the, the dollar has been um yeah the dollar's been been weakening over the last few days and it's only now in the last couple of days where you've started to see the dollar really starting to sort of have a a, a, a selling pressure come through that you're seeing the silver price rally with that but again i'm not all the all that interested in sort of chasing this higher because it just seems to me that at, that every time you get these sort of rallies it does tend to still roll over there's still big i suppose you could argue still big support around that 1550 level that seems to be a big pivot level and again that's formed a support but you would argue then you could start putting your sort of crosshair there and you could say you've got a big pivot level level up around 1730 so which caps several of the highs and the rebounds so it's sort of again a bit of a range bound play um although it yes it it does tend to be more volatile than gold so i think you need to bear that in mind but generally speaking if you actually sort of look at it on a longer term basis you wouldn't want to be necessarily long of that for too long because it tends to fall over pretty quickly um and the general trend is lower moving averages are all weak momentum indicator is not great and it's I, I think this is just a short term rally on silver before probably um continuing to chop around. I, I think silver and gold, generally speaking, I think silver and gold are going to be choppy for the rest of the year. Um, I don't see that, uh, that there's anything really significantly positive or negative about either of them. I think they're just very choppy and uh, they'll be ranging sideways. Right. Um, OK, quickly, I'll do CHF. Sorry, I did miss that one off, and I apologise for that. Um, interesting that CHF not really moved today, is it? Let's get rid of that old spike from SNB, and look at that support that comes in around that 94.80 area. you got all these lows, March, April lows. You're not really seeing that um, SNB, uh, sorry, this, it's not really seeing the Swissy... Um, make that break yet and traditionally speaking the swissy and the euro have been sort of hand in hand obviously because of the floor that's been in that, that was in place but it doesn't tend to be as tight with each other now and you can obviously see that the euro i mean euro for example up up 80 ticks today uh, whereas the uh, swiss franc is flat um so it's not really um it's not really in 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 the same sort of in the same sort of movement as the euro dollar i believe anymore and i think there is that big support in place around that 94 80 on swissy um, but other than that everything else is flat look at the moving averages look at the momentum indicators across the board flat um question can all pairs uh, sorry can all pairs discount the price before the move in the opposite direction not entirely i don't entirely understand that question um which moving average is best for one hour time frame okay well let's look at gold um it, it 
I mean, you can't. I don't think you can put a specific uh, number on a moving average. I think you. Um, it, it can. It can be that different moving averages work differently for different charts. Um, I, I've sort of said that before. Um, I mean, say for example, on. It, it, I think moving averages depend on whether you're in a, a trending market or a trade or a sideways trend, trending sideways trading market, because they become the, a very good gauge i think in trending markets but not so much in sideways markets now for example gold sideways market moving average is pretty much useless um basically because the moving average is all average out these sort of whipping moves whereas let's go to cable which has been trending and as i said on cable you've got this 55 hour moving average which traditionally throughout this rally has been pretty decent as it as a gauge pretty pretty much caught all the recent lows in the past week so that is an interesting moving average on that so it, d it does always depend i think on which uh what instrument you're looking at um and whether it's trending or whether it's sideways um once again i would um i would argue that as ever i, I look at um fibonacci levels so 21 55 89 i mean okay that should be 144, I apologise, um, and 144. So that is because I use Fibonacci. Uh, um, I like to use Fibonacci a lot, uh, and I think that um, using Fibonacci uh, moving averages uh, sort of ties in with that process, but it doesn't necessarily mean it would work for you. Some people will use 20, 50, 90, 200. It is, again, each to their own, and um, I, I would still look at um, sort of the same numbers across different times. So... Uh, in an hourly chart, in a daily chart, in a weekly chart, I would still use 21, 55, 89, and 144. Right, um, I think um, I'm getting the giddy up from FX Street, so I wish you good luck in your trading. And there we go, that's right. Okay, so um, I've got a, uh, obviously uh, a website uh, on um, Handset Markets that you can uh, go to and you can use my research. Absolutely no problem at all. Um, let me just bring that in and go to market research. It's all there, uh, handtechfx.com. And uh, you can see here my um, my research that I put out on a daily basis. Um, so you can look at that. Um, my Twitter handle is at handtechrich if you want to engage with me on Twitter. Uh, and if you've got any questions with what I've talked about today, uh, then you can um, go to marketing at handtechfx.com and um, we will answer your questions or I'll do my very best to do so. So that's actually wrong. I'll look at the disclaimer once more and I wish you good luck in all your trading. And I hope that what I've talked about today has been helpful. Um, and uh, yes, I wish you good luck. Thank you very much indeed.